We'll intervene whenever we decide it's in our national security interest to intervene. And if you don't like it, lump it. The problem with America is not that we go around marauding around the world imposing ourselves. Mm. The problem with America in the last 10, 15 years since the end of the Cold War, really in the last 60 years, is that we've been too slow to get involved. I don't know how many Iraqi civilians were killed, but I can assure you that the number is the absolute uh, minimal that it's possible uh, in modern warfare. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. You know, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. Welcome to the Darkened Hour. Welcome to another episode of the Darkened Hour, and I'm your host, Adam Fitzgerald. And today with me is a first time, a repeat visitor to the Darkened Hour, my co-host, Richard Cox. Richard, thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having me back, Adam. Yeah. In this, uh, position as guest. Absolutely. Uh, Richard, you know, this episode basically is going to center around the Energy of Empire series, which touches on the history of in Western imperialism and questions whether we live, in the, we live in the age of empires still, or have we evolved past this age? Um, yet, it seems through watching these episodes, uh, we have not evolved. In fact, we continue to be the world empire. Um, and in this series, you question the American political motivations under the administrations of William McKinley to Theodore Roosevelt, uh, where you suggest the age of empire uh, came to fruition around this period. And after watching most of these episodes, um, I could probably say that this is definitely the area to concentrate on in terms of where the um, where U.S. imperialism started. And I, I like to start with episode two, which is Hawaii, the Bayonet Constitution. Um, and my question will be that you start off the series with the state of Hawaii and how a businessman of the sugar and pineapple industries and prominent lawyer, Lauren Thurston, who led the annexation club and overthrew Hawaiian queen Lilo Kuani in 1893, which was backed by the U.S. military, which resulted in the provisional government of Hawaii controlled by Thurston's committee, and that the treaty was not ratified under President Cleveland, however, but by July of 1898, the annexation formed the Treaty of Hawaii under President McKinley. This was the first foreign government, the United States federal government, forcibly overthrew. And you asked the question, had President Cleveland had foreseen the implications of this event and whether this was the death of the republic? Mm. Is that what happened here? Yeah. Well, in some ways, no, because it's an arbitrary starting point, right? And the United States did not become an empire when it ultimately annexed Hawaii. The United States had been an empire long before through the Indian Wars, the war with Mexico, and you could also say the secessionist war, or the civil war with the South. But the, now the eagle spreads its wings overseas. And that makes it kind of obvious, right? Because there's kind of an inevitability of scuffles with Indian tribes and the, the, the winner, the outcome is kind of going to be inevitable there. So in starting with Hawaii, I was looking for a jumping in point to history because you could just go, obviously, every historical event comes to the one before. So you, you could end up with the origins of the universe if you're not careful. So I committed what Scott Horton calls the salt water fallacy, that an empire only becomes an empire when it goes overseas, because that period just after Hawaii provokes this great debate in the United States of uh, do they become an imperial power or are they going to stand by the republic? And what happened in Hawaii, the, um, it kind of set up a template where a group of local Hawaiians overthrew the government and the Hawaiian government then could have taken power back but the U.S. Marines arrived and said, look, we're not fomenting a coup here, but you can't be hurting American citizens and you can't be arresting and harassing them. So we're just going to send the Marines in to look after the Americans 
who are also engaged in a coup. And that's a, a copy and paste template later on for Nicaragua and Honduras around 15 years later. So it's a coup that's on a coup. Uh, that was under the administration of Benjamin Harrison when Grover Cleveland later came back into power. Cleveland was not opposed to a bit of uh, imperialism for financial gain, like supporting American companies abroad, but he was opposed to this ripping up of the constitution and wholesale going and overthrowing governments. And he was outraged by this to the point of sending a warship to Hawaii and threatening to open fire to restore Queen Lilikalani. Now he backed down. And my wondering was, had he seen the direction the United States was going to move uh, as a consequence of that, would he have made a different decision? Um, mm. Because it, it, it is a crucial point. And what follows in in the years 1898, the, the, the war with Cuba and, and the Philippines, although the United States is already an empire, it really, there is a bit of a fork in the road where the United States goes one way and not the other and becomes the global empire it is today. You, you, you also detailed how the United States government erased the history of Hawaii by replacing the language, uh, the schooling, and even the overall identity. Uh, besides taking over the country for other reasons, such as the farming industry, the corporate benefits, and of course, the benefit for the U.S. military was this was about the start of U.S. imperialism was something more. Um, what was this like the overall catalyst for the future of the United States federal government in regards to taking over the smaller islands in the Pacific? And yeah, was it, this about strategy or strategic importance or was it about, say, mineral uh obtaining minerals strategically absolutely it, i mean there's a i see most of these things as a combination of different interests there's usually an economic corporate interest there's usually an ideological pursuit of just wanting to have an empire and there's usually some geostrategic benefit and hawaii is geostrategically crucial because the major markets are china even back then there's i don't like 200 million chinese i think back at the turn of the 20th century and american manufacturers and producers wanted that market well hawaii is the coaling station it doesn't get you all the way to china but you certainly need hawaii to get uh, the rest of the way to a japanese island or something to to coal up again and um, so absolutely and then it takes on a, a military significance too for future wars the invasion of the philippines and um, so yet yeah, yeah geostrategy absolutely the um the educational point you make that's really a continuation of the indian wars and is common to other empires like Britain and South Africa or uh, the Japanese in Korea, the erasure of language and culture. And often carried out by people who feel they're doing a benevolent thing, right? Who have a vision of the world where, in this case, white Anglo-Saxon culture is the best. That's obviously demonstrated by the 19th century and technology in their minds. And we need to get these primitive backward pe people in the schoolhouse. And it might be hard on them. They might feel attached to their culture. But if we can knock that out of them, and um, it's for the all for the good. And there's actually a, a cartoon of uh, Uncle Sam instructing a, a classroom of native children and waving a big stick at the time. This kind of he's gonna kind of thrash their tribal habits out of them and bring them kicking and screaming into the, the modern world. Um so yeah, and then obviously Hawaii takes on this much greater geostrategic significance of the war with Japan. And just after I made the episode, actually, um Abby Martin did a whole load of reporting on the Hawaiian uh, water being poisoned by the fuel depots. Yes. Um, now, if, um, uh, what's it called, Pearl Harbor. You know, so that, that just broke afterwards. It's a major thing that the consequence of the um, that invasion back in, or not well, invasion, annexation back in 1893. Well, yeah, invasion really, um, is Hawaiians today are, are suffering from it, drinking poison water now. Yeah, I, I, look, uh... You know, we could fast forward to today's uh, period regarding what is happening in this in the past. Is that they're much more subtle. It just seemed that much they were much more primitive and out with their agendas in terms of like political motivations or their racial motivations. They're much more subtle now, and it's much more uh, covert now. In terms, yeah, they of they probably felt they were being subtle then, as compared to what people had said fifty or hundred years right. before that. So there is this then, even then, the word empire is going out of fashion a bit. Certainly, in the United States, they have to make an effort yes. to say we're not we're not a, one of those European empires. We're pursuing the large policy, right? So this is now now you would call this internationalism or something, or you'd say no, no, 
uh, we have a responsibility to protect or something like that. You, the, the language gets more subtle with time. But for us to look back on like Theodore Roosevelt, he's just he, he seems like an absolutely unfiltered imperialism mm. who is just I suggest like if you want to know what modern politicians, I, I say Dick Cheney. Um, are thinking, you might look at what Theodore Roosevelt was saying, because he could say it then. Mm. Not quite in literally, they're not quite literally the same thing, but the, the pattern, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, in, also, let's go to chapter three, that's Cuba. Mm. You, you stated that President Theodore Roosevelt was indeed rather sociopathic, as you alluded to here as well. Um, one instance that stood out to me was that he said this about Mark Twain, uh, I like to skin Mark Twain alive. Also, Roosevelt resigned from his post as Assistant Secretary of the Navy so he can insert himself into the war in 1898. Is this how Roosevelt saw himself as some leading figure in terms of getting the United States uh, as the preeminent power by any means necessary? Yeah, I think there's no doubt Theodore Roosevelt is the craziest person to ever become president of the United mm. States, whatever else he might be. The, the That's leader what I got life. from your episode. <laughs> yeah, he's, and, he, and people at the time recognized it. Like he was actually put in the position of vice president to keep him away from doing damage in other areas. And um, was a, a Republican party member at the time, Mark Hanna said, like you've put anything happens to McKinley, this mm. lunatic is going to be. Right. Yeah. But just, I mean, amazing quotes about him. The way I try and get into the mindset is I think he seems to be, like when I was a kid, there were computer games like uh, Civilization. Okay, we have to build a civilization, and then you can go to war with other civilizations. And you don't feel sort of morally bad about building battleships and tanks and sailing them across the sea and taking over some other civilization because it's pixels on the screen, right? Mm -hmm. And you're, con you're not concerned necessarily about the individual lives of people in those imaginary cities. You're concerned about the destiny of your great civilization. Well, because essentially you're recognizing there's a, a level difference between me, the player, and the imaginary pixels that aren't really alive. And that's the way I can maybe access a bit of Theodore Roosevelt's mindset and people like him. Is this, he's the player of the game and the game is what's important is the destiny of nations. It's not about individuals. That would be seen as a very uh, wishy-washy kind of philosophy. That So with that in mind, like Roosevelt was became more and more opposed to free markets as he went on because free markets produce things like comfortable sofas to sit in and uh, luxury items people want um, but they don't they don't serve the destiny of nations they don't um, make you great on the stage so to me it's a kind of acting out of an impulse to manifest oneself but with no sense of boundary to that with no sense that you don't have the right to drag a nation into that and, mm. and go and engage in a violent war so yeah um really revealing as the as the kind of empire on mass like what people say about donald trump that donald trump did as a favor in a sense because donald trump's a bit like the empire unmasked you know he he right, lacked right. the kind of uh, sophistication of a barack obama who can put a, a nice intellectually refined face on the empire right. exactly right so we, we i think this is a great uh, comparison because what we saw with obama was a handsome man very well articulate harvard a constitutional professor and on the other hand, we have this reality star who's grotesque in every other way, can't hide it. And yet this is exactly the dual face you're talking about mm. in terms of American imperialism. And these are just presidents, okay? These are not the real influential uh, dangers to society. They're just the spokesman chosen to be the spokesman for people that don't want to be seen and heard. And, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I just, would, would I, the psychology, I think what, um, there are all these episodes, this is something I remarked to you at, before we started recording, was the, the underlying message here is about the psychology of the federal government. Well, an aspect of it. So I've called it the energy yeah. of empire, because yeah. energy is a broad, all-embracing term. And that's in contrast to a conspiracy vision of history, okay, which posits like a small group of actors Mm. are pulling the strings and i'm not saying that's not true but it's one aspect of a totality that continuously recreates this pattern of of empire and psychology is of course a major aspect another major aspect of that yeah and you know just to harp on that chapter with cuba um this seems to be a glimpse of, of the beginning of modern day imperialism uh and roosevelt's rough riders 
advanced to Kettle Hill in 1898 to capture Cuba. Uh, this could be seen as the army. It, it, well, the Rough Riders are seen as the army's third infantry division. It's, it's similar to the army's third infantry division of Baghdad in 2003. Yet you, you, you couldn't really discern any major differences between the two besides the technological means. Mm. Has this always been the case regarding the U.S. government and their need to have a continuous state of war? Yeah. Yeah, for a whole host of reasons, for the, the economic setup, this belief that you need to find expanding markets overseas, this, the way that corporations can essentially buy politicians uh, to do their bidding, the way you have a kind of ruling class drawn from an elite who, who share those interests, the way you have ideology, imperialistic ideology, all these forces come together. And then the war machine itself becomes a, a self-perpetuating thing. So, you know, when, when the Cold War um, goes, that, that was just not long after, um, uh, what's the name of the, the, the Fifth Fleet, uh, the, the Middle Eastern command had been set up there. So that has to find different justifications because the Red Army aren't going to pour into Iran anymore. And um, so you have these self-sustaining bureaucracies. So, yeah, uh, totally. And and the, the land invasion of Cuba was actually a disaster. It didn't win the war at all that the american they've been the american army was used to fighting um wars against plains indians so they all fell off the boat when they arrived at cuba and didn't know how to disembark and then they all got sick of yellow fever and it was a, a complete disaster uh, so the navy the, the advanced american navy won the war at, at sea but you also have this factor with um the the spanish american war um which that's what the invasion of cuba was they were fighting spain over cuba was a way of unifying the country after the Civil War, if you allow me to call it that. The, because North and South were very divided at the time, so there was this conscious effort to bring um, southern, old Southern generals. A few of them were still kicking about, apparently, and they were brought in to fight alongside the Northern generals and, and command the army. And um, wars have acted to have a unifying effect on the United States since then, because this is, people are individually are more bound together by an external threat than they are by common similarities so same with the nation state when you have these constant external threats you have to go off and, and manage it it nullifies the internal differences between the states and that that, that was quite consciously spoken about at the time it's it uh, no one says that anymore right no one says oh yeah the reason we go to war is to stop like a civil war breaking out in the united states again <laughs> or to right. stop the kind of climate you see now but that was that was just very openly admitted to at the time well, I, look, and just to follow up on terms of the Civil War, I mean, in this country, uh, I don't see it as like a Civil War that we've seen in the uh, 18th century. Uh, I think what we're going to see in the future is basically more of a riot in terms of speak, like small pockets of resistance in cities and based on fringe conspiracy and also uh, political division. Uh, I think that's right now the, I want to say the most antagonistic uh, item in the United States is politics. It's such a, I never seen, I, I, I'm 52. I don't think I've ever seen the country more divisive mm. in regards to politics than they are at, at any point. Um, yeah. So my speculation is that these patterns tend to recreate themselves and you would have seen another civil war in the United States by now, had it not been for technology. So if there was still a 19th century right, level right, of technology, right. there would have been, but now it's like we're living in a world that we can't really predict how these things play out, but we can't predict they'll happen. And there is a kind of war-like feeling. I would suggest when people have complete contempt for people on the opposite side of the political spectrum, and a total refusal to engage with their viewpoints at all, and are totally locked into their own media narrative, mm. Mm. you are kind of at war at that stage, but you're just fighting that war through a ballot box where you're trying to get your guy to win right. so right. he can dominate the other side and keep exactly. them down. It's not about creating a consensus in society. So, and you see this like in Canada with the trucker protest. It, in a sense, like Justin Trudeau stopped being a legitimate leader at that point because you have to keep... Also, you win a democratic mandate if these things make any sense at all. To the extent they make any sense at all, you might win it from less than 50% of the population, but you have to stay within a realm that keeps the overwhelming majority of the population on board, even the people that didn't vote for you or are ideologically opposed to. When you step outside of that, 
you've lost any claim to a democratic mandate, really. So I would say that's probably the case in the United States now. (laughs) So there is a kind of war going on. It's just a case of how does that play out with 21st century technology? You know, I want to jump back to that chapter of Cuba because I found something very interesting is that you mentioned about Henry Cabot Lodge as saying Mm. that if Spain did not withdraw from Cuba, the United States would declare war. And of course, this was not about actually liberating Cuba, frankly, uh, but more about taking colonizing Cuba just publicly. Uh, could you talk more about this? Yeah, well, initially, the American government was happy to have Spain rule Cuba because American business interests had access to the islands through that. And if the Cuban rebels overthrew the Spanish government, well, then you could have land redistribution or anything go on. And so it's a very unstable uh, board then. So it seems like at some point the um, figures in the U.S. government and the business world lost faith in the Spanish government's ability to hold the islands in this most recent of rebellions that was going on. Um, so then it's it, the, the war was based on this, the, what we would now call a humanitarian intervention or a responsibility to protect. The, the, the Spanish are committing all sorts of atrocities against Cubans. Some of that was entirely true. Um, and it was entirely also built up beyond that in the, the American press. And um, that was the justification. But the, obviously the real reasons were commercial interests right. and geostrategic. Again, um, particularly Puerto Rico is the first bit of land you encounter if you're going to the Americas. So it's, it's geostrategically significant. If you want to the further incursions into Latin America, very good islands um, to hold. And yeah, commercial with the, you can just see the commercial with the, um, what the American government did to the economy of sugar, the economy of Cuba afterwards with the uh, devaluation of the currency and the taking over the, um, the, the sugar uh, plantations and so on and being held by a very small number of them. Um, American businessmen and the annexation of Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. uh, which that, that one I didn't know anything about. I didn't know anything about Puerto Rico at all um, prior to doing the, the series. So that was a real revelation to me. So the, um, the annexation of Puerto Rico and the then just conscripting men to fight in the, the First World War. So you, you're suddenly told you have to go and fight for this foreign government. Imagine being a, a Puerto Rican islander, you know, but you're suddenly sent off to the far side of the world to fight against Germans. You know, it's crazy. And so, yeah, it was entirely self-serving reasons, of course. Sure, and that jumps right into the uh, next question, because that's what I have a question for you. Right. It seems that Roosevelt didn't even waste any time here. He almost, almost immediately after the end of the Spanish-American War in Cuba, and just eight days after it gained independence, Puerto Rico was next. And what benefits did Puerto Rico possess, uh, which gave the United States any reason to militarize it? Yeah, well, more of the same in terms of um, plantations there. I do think Theodore Roosevelt just wanted it because it was there. I don't think he had any great reason for it necessarily. Right. Yeah. And it is uh, kind of geostrategic. It's the most eastward land um, in the Caribbean. So it's, and, and it has been, um, I think it was Puerto Rico that was used for, for the launching pad for the invasion of Panama uh, later on in the 80s. And it's been a, um, like a military testing ground. The island of Vieques uh, was bought, has been bombed smithereens over the years of all sorts of uh, pollution. Uh, effects on the population, cancers in the population. And I, at, at the start of the series, I, I knew that went on, but I didn't know how widespread it was, but it's like everywhere, like Hawaii, Guam, uh, wow. the Philippines, every, all the, the Okinawa, like there's so many pollution problems and high rates of cancer around these American bases. I had, I had no idea. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, the, the, I, I wasn't so clued into the sheer extent of the environmental problems they create. This vast base network around the world. How long has that been going on? How long has the the bombing the pollu- yeah the, the yeah well yeah the bombing and the pollution well problem. i suspect it's a post-world war ii I, I couldn't i don't know exactly but i'm going to suspect it's a post-world war ii thing when the because the united states didn't have a, a huge standing army prior to that or a huge air force so that right. um certainly with the bikini islands out in the pacific they were tested with uh, nuclear bombs in the uh, post-world war ii era and the the people there were essentially uh, human guinea pigs in in radiation experiments so american doctors right, come along right. and say oh yeah we've got this treatment were giving you and it wasn't a treatment at all they were just coming along to monitor like how quickly they were dying after they had the nuke set off on them lord you 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 also stated that roosevelt granted them citizenship but he didn't do it out of his own good heart it seems he wanted to conscript them 
yeah. into the U.S. military to serve in World War One. That while was also, um, while also Woodrow Wilson. Atta- yeah, that was that would be well, later on. Sorry. Yeah, Wilson. Right. Sorry. So this is right yeah. in 1916 when they get their citizenship. Right. It's like, oh joy! <laughs> I wonder why you've got that. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. Oh, here's a rifle. Off to Germany with you. <laughs> but it also became a tax haven, I believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it's in absolute financial dire straits today. The I, I can't remember the figure of the death they have there, but it's it's, it's it's it's. I think it's like half as wealthy as the poorest U.S. state. So it's yeah, diabolically run for the the past hundred years. Wow, now. that's incredible. I I, I mean, I know I've, I have personal friends that are from the mainland of Puerto Rico, right? And um, I had not known anything about the dire position that the island is in, and um, it just seems to me that uh, a lot of that area is very underrepresented in in media or in schools in terms of history. And I think I know why is because of the history that we're alluding to here today. Yeah, well, a lot of Puerto Ricans report this experience of coming to the United States and meeting Americans who don't understand their status. They think Puerto Rico is a foreign country or something, and it is right. kind of confusing because what is it? It's a territory. What? <laughs> you know, like, right. do countries have territories these days? Right. It's, it's a very nineteenth-century concept. Yeah, it's outdated. Totally. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Outdated. It goes on. Yeah. Um, so, Guam is kind of the same, but the, like the older people in Guam um, don't despise their American overlords so much because however bad the Americans were, the Japanese were worse, right? And the no. Americans got rid of the Japanese. So that's a bit of a different cultural setup. Right. See, now, look, look after all this is uh, this period of gaining the islands itself, we see like a, a jump to more progressive ideas of demilitarizing or destabilizing uh, threats to the imperialist nature of the United States. So I fast forward to, to your chapter in Japan. Uh, now, in this chapter, you duly noted that during the 16th century, Japan had suppressed any Western influence, which included the spread of Christianity. Yeah. Um, one film in particular I saw uh, by Scorsese, um, and I can't remember the name of the film, Liam Neeson's in it, and it was a fantastic film, and uh, it was about the suppression of Christianity in the country. The reason was because uh, Japan saw Christianity as a wicked ideology, where they can also they also saw this as a probe of the West mm. to probe whether the country was weak or not. Can, can you talk about this? Yeah, well, that's exactly right. That's um, so Japan has this like hundred year warring states period in the eighteen mm. hundreds, and then. Um, finds this 250 year period of stability under the Tokugawa uh, dynasty, the shogunate. Then, and and during that period, uh, Christians in the early 1600s have been traveling to Japan. And uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu, I think that's how you say it, he uh, booted them all. And it was only a few Dutch traders were allowed in. And, and Japanese ships had to have um, like shallow bottoms so they couldn't sail across the sea because they just decided there was nothing out there worth seeing. And that, yeah, the Christians, they saw it as um, European powers would probe a country to find out if it was militarily strong or weak and if it, if it was weak they'd take over and if it was strong they'd send in the Christians to convert the population and subvert them and then take over by more subtle means so there was this ban until uh, well, Japanese banned all foreigners until the 1850s when the US warships rolled in and um, insisted that they open their ports and Right. And the name of the film was actually uh, called um, Silence, based upon Christian missionaries that visited the island. Um, When Japan invaded Taiwan and China, the U.S. saw this as a chance to cyber Japan as an extension of future U.S. imperialism. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt saw Japan as the imperial rival where you Mm. speculated that this may have led to the attack at Pearl Harbor and whether or not the U.S. had advanced knowledge. Uh, But quite a remarkable charge, but nevertheless unsurprising considering how they saw Japan like they do with Russia during the Cold War. Yeah, Theodore Roosevelt saw Japan as a potential imperial partner, like a junior partner in Eastern Mm -hmm. Japan. The Japanese played a clever game uh, with the restoration of the emperor that they saw that they couldn't strengthen themselves enough to resist American encroachment. So they adopted 
not only Western technology, but also a lot of Western cultural norms and got kind of adopted as honorary Aryans. I think that's the name of the, the part of the, the chapter of the podcast um, I did. And Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt liked this kind of thing. Uh, and he was, there was jujitsu wrestlers visiting the United States and um, doing matches for him against uh, American wrestlers. And this was all kind of very interesting to him. And so he, he appreciated the Jap the Japanese Bushido culture really spoke to him. Okay. And yet he saw Japan as a, a way that potentially if they could get um, a further coaling station to go into China and also as a bulwark against Russia. So in Roosevelt's mind, like he's playing a zero sum game, like an imperialist off and all that there's, the world is finite in scope, and at some point, with the rise of technology, a culture is going to come to dominate, okay? And we want it to be the Anglo-Saxon culture, because that's the best one, clearly. So we want Anglo-Saxon legal norms to be across, across the world, and we don't want um, the major potential rival would be the Slavic people, Russia. And so just look at the size of the country at that point mm. and their, their resources. Russia was rapidly industrializing at the time. And this has always been like perhaps the major Western threat. You can like see it back in the Crimean War and you see it today, right? You see it in Afghanistan in the 80s, we need to keep Russia down. Mm. And you see it's going on in the Ukraine now. The, the world is mm. again fighting a proxy war with Russia. So uh, Britain actually signed an alliance with Japan in the um, just at the beginning of the 20th century, which is an unusual thing for Britain to do at the time. They didn't like entangling alliances. And they supplied them with uh, with warships and Theodore Roosevelt. And this is amazing, right? But he, he couldn't sign uh, an alliance or a treaty at the time. That would be unthinkable for a U.S. president because the United States is completely opposed to uh, entangling alliances. And then World War II happens and you're in NATO and that's that. Uh, but, yeah, the idea was to use the Japanese to keep the Russians out of Manchuria, out of China and keep uh, the Chinese uh, markets open to to the West, which they successfully did. Uh, but they created a bit of a monster <laughs> in doing it. Which and then the, at some point there was this shift in attitudes. Um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had family connections back to uh, China and thought more favorably of them. And then when the Japanese are acting quite brutally in China, that, that came back and it did. You can see this in, I'm, I'm not, I don't blame, like place the entirety of the blame on um, Roosevelt and the encouragement the Japanese got from this. It has to obviously fall squarely on the Japanese imperialists, but you can sort of look back to the Roosevelt presidency and see uh, the origins of the, the Second World War. You know, I do want, let me follow up on this, Richard, because I think this is something that we've touched on before, and it's something that is a uh, prominent face at the table in terms of conversation about world history, and that uh, in terms of conspiracy theory, in that mm. By the turn of this century, you know, we there are people who are still today prominent. And one of them is Alex Jones. In, in regards to who's actually controlling the world in terms of like war, for example, and imperialism. And you, you have anywhere between the Illuminati, so to speak, or the, uh, you know, the banking industry led by the Rothschild family. Mm. And, uh, uh, you know, even the more egregious, more fanatical in terms of like alien life forms visiting and telling certain people and congressional delegations what to do in terms of uh, depopulizing the world. Has, is there any semblance of truth in any of these at all? Or is basically these can be just be dismissed as irrational speech? Well, how would you categorize all the stuff we just talked about? Because I would say all of that is fairly conspiratorial. OK, you have Theodore Roosevelt engaging in secret diplomacy with Japan mm. to be a proxy force. And you have people in the kind of social clubs of the Eastern establishment conspiring to, OK, um, Mr. Hurst, you get the newspapers on board for this war with Cuba. And uh, Mr. Lodge is in Congress. He'll get rally around the troops there and then will put forward this message about how the Spanish are abusing Cuban women and make sure they look white when you do the cartoons of them because our boys won't want to fight for, for dark-skinned women. Um, so this is all conspiratorial, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I think straight away, Alex Jones is more than half right in that. The, the world works in a much more conspiratorial way than is generally presented. Because I think a lot of 
biographies of Roosevelt don't talk about him as such a nefarious actor in this way and so responsible right. as an architect of the American empire. He's usually seen as somebody who did wonderful things in regulation of the meat industry or something, you know, and mm -hmm. um, advanced kind of a more inwardly progressive agenda. So uh, on that, and actually, I, I, as we record this, I've just done episode 11 on South Africa. Well, episode 12, I'm looking at the Anglo-American establishment, the concept of Cecil Rhodes, I've just popped over to British imperialism for a bit. I'll be heading back to the US as soon as possible. But the, the, the idea of Cecil Rhodes setting up a secret society with the aim of taking over as much of the world as possible. And that's a thing that he tried to do. Okay. And I'll, 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 obviously, I think most conventional historians don't think it got very far because they don't talk about it. Um, but there's a contingent who think that Cecil Rhodes' Society of the Elect or the Anglo-American establishment have been the defining force in 20th century history. Now, as I sit here today, I tend to think that's going too far. What I tend to think you have is a kind of continuity of ideology, that different people under different times come into a similar ideology of wanting to expand power and of wanting to set up these global government bodies so that their ideology, which is, of course, as far as they're concerned, is the right one, the best one, um, can reach out across the world for good and ill. Uh, so th that I tend to see it more that way than you've had a continuous one group of people. Now, but I, I am very, this is in some ways, for me, doing the series is a way to challenge myself on that and say, okay, is it a bit more conspiratorial than I think? Are there more consistent groups? Because you, like you say about the Rothschild family, well, I think a lot of the Rothschild conspiracy theories come from fabricated quotes, like, and a lot of conspiracy theorists um, don't seem to check quotes when it suits their agenda, okay, to think that right. uh, Nathan Rothschild took over the entire British economy in 1815 by having his um, runners come back from the Battle of Waterloo uh, with information that um, Wellington lost ahead of anyone else. Like, so I, I, on another series I'm doing on, on conspiracy, I checked that story and it first appears like, 40 years later, coming out of the mouth of a French socialist. Right? So no one in London at the time mentioned this, that Rothschild had just taken over the entire British economy. Um, it comes out of a French socialist who didn't really like wealthy Jewish banking families very much. Um, so, and that you, you find this, that every time somebody misattributes a quote to Rothschild, some sort of cartoonish villain quote, uh, that will just enter conspiracy literature, like straight yeah. off, as if it's a true thing. Uh, and of course, like our ancestors wrote satire they made shit up, right? <laughs> in all the ways we do. And, and there's that, when you, when you start to simplify and take all that out, uh, then you can start to get into conspiracy theories, which I think have a lot, um, have like far too much continuity in terms of the groups. But I'm willing to be like challenged on that. Yeah, and this series definitely does because when I was watching your series in the last two weeks, it, it I was thinking both that the, of the more historical aspects and what we what little we do know, because like you said, there is a, a concentrated effort in keeping this history from us. Uh, but you know, secrets are hard to keep, and yes, some history does leak out. But at the same time, we're met with a, a tsunami of disinformation, and with that comes these fringe conspiracies. I, I consider myself a conspiracy theorist. I think you do mm. too. But we're yeah. we have, we're a limit in terms of that. Uh, we're not fringe conspiracy theorists. One who just advocates a speculation, which is basically a rational speculation, uh, as opposed to rational speculation in terms of conspiracy theory. I think that's the defining line regarding ourselves. And this series itself, you have to entertain the fact that, wow, there's, there is conspiracy in terms of history, but where does the limit draw the line because you know we're awash with people like Alex Jones and in, in, in disinformation that comes from it. Now, the reason why he's still relevant is like you said, is because he does speak on relevant and truthful facts, but they are very minute. And that's what keeps him relevant because have more than three quarters of the time he's acting a fool and because you know spreading these false theories. Well, it helps because he simplifies things, right? He, he speaks with a megaphone, both literally and right, right. symbolically, you know? And for Alex Jones, there's this kind of simple enough narrative where it's all the Illuminati or whatever. It's all the, the New World Order mm -hmm. agenda. And I think the nuance for me is that 
life never consists of just one pole on anything. Okay. So I'm doing a series on, um, re which really focuses on the United States, but I certainly don't wish to infer by that, that the United States is, is the great Satan and it's going around the world, smashing all these wonderful liberation movements. That's partly mm -hmm. true, but these liberation movements themselves often turn out just as bad or worse right. as the, uh, as the big empire they're trying to break free from. And um, so they're not, necessarily desirable people and that's where you see like there's a polarization of left and right whereas to people on the kind of hard right all these left-wing movements across the world are communist insurgencies funded by moscow and the cia is doing the right thing and smashing them and there's no nuance in that where you have um people who really believe a little country like Nicaragua poses a threat to the southern border of the United States because they just they just see things with that one lens. And communism, I would say, is an evil philosophy that has built up mountains of corpses, but not everyone that assists um, resists the US empire is a communist. And on the left, you have this view that the United States is the great evil going around smashing liberation movements that are always for the good. Fidel Castro is a wonderful human being who's doing his absolute best mm. for Cuba, even to the point of trying to reform Stalin and Mao. So you have this monopolar way of looking at the world. And that's true with conspiracy, that anything that, like I, I could, and I'm sure you could, Adam, make some stuff up and it would find its way into the conspiracy lexicon. If you fabricate a few Rothschild or Rockefeller quotes, mm -hmm. okay, they, they could sift their way in and be accepted and be quoted in books and all sorts and, and do the rounds because there's a lack of awareness that they're very aware that power structures are corrupt and awful and seek to dominate and control, mm -hmm. but they're not aware of the other pole, which is people make stuff up, people write propaganda. Um, people have very low standards of evidence, and you have to have those like two poles, I think, to otherwise you just go off in an unlimited direction, an unlimited distance in, in one direction and end up in, in Jonestown. Fast forward to Nicaragua. Mm. Uh, General Alfonso Estrada Agron took over as Nicaragua's president when Jose Madrid went into exile. And in this chapter, you know that the New York Times reported on it, and the United States became the ultimate ruler of the country. But later, a rebellion broke out, and the U.S. Marines got involved and occupied the country for the next 20 years. Could you possibly elaborate on just how much the U.S. controlled the country at this point? Well, essentially, I don't think it was absolutely so there were elections in Nicaragua, but if things went too far out of kilter for the, the oligarchy, the Marines were were sent in. And then the Somoza family took over and ran the country, I think, perfectly to the satisfaction of Washington until the 1970s when there's an earthquake. Um, Manuga is destroyed in that. And then you have the, the Sandinistas who are named after uh, Augusto Sandino, who was a, a rebel leader back in the 30s who was uh, murdered by the Samosas. Um, they then come to power and this civil war breaks out in Nicaragua where, and this is really the, the deplorable thing that um, the US did, the Reagan administration did in that time, of essentially sponsoring uh, terrorist groups and dressing them up as, as freedom fighters in, in the media. Uh, and again, to, just to refer to what I've just been saying a moment ago, that's not to, I, I try not to paint the Sandinistas as whiter than white, freedom fighter heroes they were going around conscripting people um who didn't want to go fight for them in, into the army they were running the economy in a way that they could it could only really fail uh, so there is a, a certain a, a balance uh, there but they were not at the same time the puppets of moscow who were just looking to spread this evil empire across the world so um yeah that's but does that answer your question yeah no uh because it leads up to the next one it, this is something that uh doesn't surprise me because because it seems that with the next administration just things continually to get more uh worse in time because when carter ordered cia support for the labor unions and the press in nicaragua they because the reason why was because they wanted samosa and the national guard intact yeah <laughs> however however when reagan became president he then supports the contras which led to the infamous mass murders of the sandinistas and supporters but after U.S. support was banned by Congress, the Reagan administration covertly continued it. And these, illegal, these activities, illegal activities, by the way, culminated in the Iran-Contra affair. And you talked about whether or not Reagan is evil in this episode. 
Mm. I, I think this would be the definition of it, no? Well, that's an interesting point, right? There's something I resolved in my own mind only when I did the episode, mm. because there is this um, theory that perpetuates in the John Birch Society that the US is secretly supporting all these communist regimes around the world, mm. which is like bonkers. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think actually post-World War II China, there's mm. they make a kind of interesting enough case there. But in, in countries like Nicaragua, yeah. But one of the things they'll, they'll point to is um, um, Carter like giving some support to uh, the uh sandinistas when they came away like letting the samosa dynasty collapse and giving some support to the the sandinistas mm. and, and why would they do that and you know is the state department full of closeted communists uh, who were it would be like that would be very strange if it was um and yeah what it what it seems is that they were trying to keep the new administration on board and bring them into a position which was congenial to u.s corporate interests and u.s national security interests in the area and then when that failed uh, the Reagan administration comes in, who were absolutely more militaristic and hardline and less likely oh, yeah. for a diplomatic solution. Yeah, then they start to sponsor the terrorists and and do so illegally um, by shipping off weapons to Iran and also mm. by, I didn't go into this too much because it's like it's narco-terrorism, narco-imperialism um, is a whole nother, that's a, a series in itself, right? But yeah, by allowing the importation of drugs from Nicaragua to the United States and setting off the crack boom of the 80s. Yeah. You know, incidentally enough, under the Reagan administration, uh, we start seeing the very first elements of the Paul Nietzsche school of neoconservatism, Dick Cheney, uh, Paul Wolfowitz and Donald Rumsfeld start, uh, you know, um, serving under the Reagan administration. And um, that's going to be on your future episodes, I'm pretty sure, because we see the expansion of U.S. imperialism come from there. In, in, in regards to the Middle East and uh, Southeast Asia. Um, outside of the, uh, the, you know, the Pacific Islands and of course, uh, uh, Asia uh, countries. And it just seems like there's a spiral uh, going on in that area of the world in regards to taking control of the, uh, the region itself, always in a perpetual state of conflict, it seems. And, you know, history seems to repeat itself. Uh, for example, you touched on this before in regards to uh, U.S. backing of these right-wing uh, ultra-Orthodox or ultra-nationalist groups, such as what we did with Afghanistan in 1979 when the Soviets invaded the, the capital of Kabul. Uh, like you said before, there is no winner here. The you know, Soviets are you know, evil in its own right for their own agendas. But at the same time, we're fighting evil with evil because we actually spent billions of dollars. Fast forward to the current day, guess what we're doing? Once again, uh, we're, we're funding and training the ultra-nationalist, you know, these right-wing neo-Nazi groups in Ukraine in the disputed territories of Lashank and Donbas against the evil Russian empire. Meanwhile, the left won't basically say, you know, that, yeah, we helped to facilitate this in 2014, but we're fighting the evil country in Russia. Is that what we're saying today, Richard? Yeah, well, I wonder, Adam, if history really does rhyme then that would mean 20 years from now, the United States will be invading Ukraine after Ukrainian right-wing nationalists set up mm. some terrorist event in the United States. You know? So I wonder if that'll happen. Yeah, no, it's entirely, entirely what we're seeing, right. isn't it? Well, it's, what's that quote? Uh, to find out who tomorrow's enemies are, find out who we're funding today. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and right-wing nationalists are a far more convenient terrorist nowadays than the Islamic population, because the Islamic population... Um, there is a limit to the level of internal crackdown you can do when your enemy is Middle Eastern as all Muslims, because okay? there's just not that many of them in, in the United States. But if your enemy is right-wing nationalist, well, you can see them anywhere, right? Like yeah. you could be a right-wing nationalist. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. There is no like hidden agenda. See, with, well, well, with you know, it's funny you bring this up because with, with Islamic fundamentalism, they have, uh, they were much more, covert in terms of uh, integrating within the society. Ultra-nationalists are very obtuse, very outwardly, and they're almost like they're proud to display it. And uh, especially with the uh, people, they call themselves the Trumpers. Uh, they basically are nationalists in that regards, uh, but they don't hide the fact that they are. You know, they just come right out and say it. So that would make a much more obvious enemy itself in its own right yeah there's more of an overt kind of bellicose energy to it isn't it and that's a split with like 
the Republican Democrats in the 80s, the Reagan regime, that the Democrats had a kind of a more subtle method of maintaining yes. control, mm. whereas Reagan's more of a send in the tanks kind of guy. So there is this, mm. the, the political right has this more overt kind of energy to it. It doesn't, it's not so uh, subtle and disguised and concealed. It doesn't do that so well. You know, Lawrence Wilkinson, when I interviewed him, basically said that uh, in terms of the left, they'll bleed you until you die. The right just want to kill you. Yeah, that's entirely it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, you know, fast forward to your latest episode. And boy, mm. was this a, a heavyweight shocker because I had no idea who Cecil Rhodes is. And right. boy, what a deplorable individual this man is. So <laughs> <laughs> over the weekend, I, I saw your South Africa episode. And my, my question about this one is that uh, you mentioned that Cecil Rhodes had raised the property requirements, which had a disproportionate effect on the previously growing number of enfranchised Black people in the Cape, under the Cape Qualified Franchise that had been enforced since 1853. By limiting the amount of land which Black Africans were legally allowed to hold to further disenfranchise Black population. And this had such an effect various tone to it. Could you speak more about that? Yeah, well, I just feel the need to explain why we're in South Africa and the British Empire all of a sudden mm. after being in the US. So what I'm ultimately doing is um, I stopped the, the US series in, in um, 1912, uh, just before Woodrow Wilson comes in, because there's a bit of a change of tone then to the empire. And I'm wanting to do uh, the run into the uh, First World War, obviously. And because that's a, a European affair, I'm just looking at, okay, where, where is the British Empire at at this point? And then and then I'm going to rejoin that with um, when the United States um, uh, becomes involved. So just starting like with the Boer War, really to to explain the run into it, and this thing called the Anglo-American establishment that Cecil Rhodes, essentially a uh, great British patriot that he he was, attempts to set up a secret society to extend Anglo-American influence as far and wide as it can possibly go. And the first overt action of that was uh, South Africa. Um, so Rhodes is down there. He's actually funded by the Rothschilds. If you like your Rothschild conspiracies. And um, he's um, owning uh, diamond mines um, down there. And he wants to use the black population in a kind of de facto slavery, okay? So by limiting the, um, excuse me, limiting the, um, their access to land, he can have them as compliant workers down the mine. So you see this kind of thing also with um, land restrictions like uh, Guatemala comes to mind in one of the, um, the reasons there was a rebellion there in the 50s was United Fruit owned vastly more land than they used, and they owned it, mm -hmm. so people couldn't use it. So then they have to work as slaves on the banana plantations. It's kind of standard thing. And after the um, after the war there, after Rhodes is dead, uh, Lord Alfred Milner became governor of uh, South Africa, and he essentially did the same thing with importing the Chinese on the kind of, you come over and you live in a nice city with a garden and everything, and you can work. And they were brought in as kind of slave labor to replace the, um, yeah, to, to work down the mines then. You know, you also mentioned in chat, which I found um, uh, quite interesting, was that Rhodes actually used to sell ice cream to the miners itself. Yeah, I lost the book that reference is in, so I just had to do it from memory. And then I found that, like, a few days I found, oh, yeah, so I think it, that is that is true. Yeah, he, he figured out some way to um, use a, 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 a steam engine from a train to uh, set up refrigerators so he could sell ice cream to miners. And also the trains were used to uh, pump water out of the mines, yeah. Well, that's incredible. I mean, for he was seventeen when he did that, which is yeah, he was, you know, he was, for, yeah, for and just a, a ingenious mind. It's like, I mean, the the person himself is basically, I think, deplorable himself. Mm. But um, very controversial figure in Britain now because like there's as he still yeah, yeah. well yeah because just in the way you have people taking statues down in the United States, Cecil Rose has a big statue at Oxford University because he gave him a lot of money. That's part of the, was his idea was to fund scholarships to Oxford, and um, that people from around the empire and the United States and Germany, because he wanted to foster good relations with Germany, would uh, be able to come and hopefully go away and live a life in public service, but with mm. this idea of unity, because he really wanted the United States in back inside the British Empire mm. in some way, maybe not called the British Empire anymore, but he thought that was like the absolute travesty that um, the United States had had left in the, in the 18th century. So the Rhodes Scholarships were a way of like... Um, or a way of just like bringing people into that ideology. Sure, you know, you know, you touch on the Rothschild family. So, I mean, it's funny because I, I, I'm always, I'm, I'm really, I don't know how to basically gauge the Rothschilds in terms of influence because so much is met 
by fringe conspiracy. Mm. And there's so little in terms of, I mean, we have a history regarding, but how much of that history can be believed? Because we see the Rothschilds in, in the media as just a very wealthy, very affluent group that doesn't have a nefarious agenda. But they do have a nefarious agenda. And you mentioned this in the uh, in the chapter here, because like you said, you know, there was a, this this part of the chapter in terms of South Africa was an extension of British imperialism, which was influenced by the Rothschild family backing uh, Rhodes because they helped to fund his diamond mines uh, in, the, in the region. And, you know, you can't help but think that the Rothschilds saw this as a way to, what, uh, depopularize South, uh, South Africa of the black race, or basically uh, raise the country for the mineral wealth, or a combination of all these things, or is it basically about British imperialism for a, a global uh, extension of their power as well? Or does all of this have any... Well, uh, yeah, I think they saw it primarily as a business investment, in the same way that banks lend money to oil companies today that might be doing not very nice things with the natives around the world. You know, so in that sense, the game hasn't changed. Um, certain members of the Rothschild family were in that I idea of uh, like the expansion of the British Empire. Uh, mm -hmm. Certain members were very much for a kind of Zionist homeland for the Jews. Others were opposed to that. And um, all the members became world famous botanists. You know, so th there's like a complete diversity within the family. And like it, this is an area that I may like two years from now have a completely different opinion on. Right. But my sense with like the Rockefeller and Rothschild families is they are kind of what they're made out to be in conspiracy literature in terms mm -hmm. of them being having this very long standing and um, profound in influence on the direction of the world as compared to your average pleb on the street. But I still think it's very small. Right. I don't think that David Rockefeller goes into the, the president's the Oval Office and slams his fist on the table and says, this is the way. It's going to be, and right, the same right. with the Rothschilds in Britain or else. I, I, I think they they have a, a subtle influence, um, but you know it. They, they they're still kind of pawns in the game, right? Whereas we're not even in the game. You and I, we're just talking on a podcast that a few people are listening to, and right. you know, pretending that we're changing something here. <laughs> you know, but um, I think the the power is in the system itself. That is the overwhelming wave, this tidal wave, this vast energy that everyone is being carried along by and if any of them stepped outside of that then that they they wouldn't um have any impact at all so that, that's kind of how i view it i would think the same way because i i myself when i i i studied 9 11 right it was a very small area of history but yet at, at the same time there are many factors at play in regards to the overall structure of 9 11 why it was allowed to happen instead of just you know facilitating it you don't need to facilitate 9-11 when you already have a group of people basically willing to attack the united states not because they hate you religiously but because of your foreign policy which you helped to facilitate in the years prior to demeaning these people or depopulating and destroying these people all you have to do is basically just allow them to attack you then capitulize on this and basically you know over exaggerate the response and that's something that we see with Israel and the Palestinians. You know, Palestinians will shoot a rocket into a neighborhood in Janine or something. And basically, they just come all with the military and just shower uh, the area with bullets and missiles and whatnot. In, in terms of world history, in terms of, of, of our past and present, and probably the future, is that we're seeing a multitude of agencies and entities the banking industry, the military industry, the foreign policy industry, corporate industry, private, all these separate from each other, but they work on a common goal and they'll mm. work together with each yeah. other. Intelligence agencies are the same thing too. Um, but yes, they all have different affluences of uh, influences of power, but they are limited in what they can uh, empower. You like, for example, you just brought up a great point. You know, you can't have Dave Rockbell walk into the White House and basically bang his yeah. fist and say, this is the way it is. No, you'll have the director of the CIA or the, the World Bank, uh, World Economic Forum, the World Banking Industry. They will basically not meet with each other, but they'll basically feed off each other and say, yeah, this is the way things are. And we'll work together with this in certain respects. Exactly, yeah. And that's, I think that's but, the way the world. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. One thing, the Rothschild family, Rothschild's lost a lot of money with changes to inheritance tax 
um, in Britain in the post-First World War year. And a, a fair few of them died fighting in the Second World War. So I just think if they were really running the world, they probably wouldn't go get themselves killed in the wars right. they're supposed to be starting. So I, I do think it's so much... The, I read David Rockefeller's autobiography, right, which is it's a surprisingly entertaining read. And there's a, a quote in there that anyone who um, engages in Rockefeller conspiracy theorizing, not illegitimately necessarily, but any, any, everyone brings that up where Rockefeller says um, about how he's been instrumental throughout his life in trying to build a kind of closer global governance, one world order kind of system. But he starts out off by saying like, Rockefeller is very aware that he's the subject of all these conspiracy theories, right? And the John Birch Society have got a real picking into him and, and that kind of thing. And he says, it's, a, it, it's ridiculous what they say about me, that I'm building some global government or something. But then he seems to contradict himself and he says, well, of course, I am working for international integration and, and I'm proud of that. And, and it's kind of hard to make sense of it because it does sound like he's contradicting them. What I think about that is Rockefeller, David Rockefeller himself does not perceive himself as a particularly powerful individual he's a tiny cog in this vast machine he's a bigger cog than you and me by a long way yeah. um so i think he does probably downplay the level of um influence he had in the, he doesn't he certainly doesn't mention all the different things he was involved in in his biography which is kind of strange and i wouldn't be surprised if um coming out of his intelligence connections in world war ii he had a stronger kind of lifelong connection to the cia and his banking job was some kind of cover for that work mm -hmm. to a degree right i really wouldn't be surprised if that was the case um but like i still think he's just a small part of a machine right then and the machine is doing what it's going to do irrespective of what david rockefeller wants or or the rockefeller family or the rockefeller and rothschild but you know um they, they've got a very minor ability to direct the mm. the course the machine is taking maybe a little but not the overall direction i would say what what is so richard to, to basically uh, end the the uh, episode here, what is your um, overall agenda in creating this series? What, what what message do you want to bring to the people in uh, in regards to this series? And this series, you basically it, it could go on and on, like you said. I think before we recorded up to a hundred, and basically, you know, you probably could expand on that much more, even. But what what um, what is your overall goal for creating this series? What do you want to bring to the to the people? Well, really, to answer the kind of questions that we're speaking about today. Some, sometimes the things I'm saying to you, Adam, are like factual history, take it to the bank, and other things. I'm clearly speculating. I'm saying, well, I don't think the Rothschild and this and that and the other and they're this powerful, but not that powerful. And it's for me to gain more clarification on that kind of thing. So I think the, the most interesting way to do these things is always go into it with the aim of educating yourself. And if you're having an interesting educational experience in doing it, um, then hopefully the audience can follow along and they'll have an interesting educational experience too. So that's the thing really. And overall, I'm looking to understand myself, how we've ended up in a world um, where 10 years from now, we're apparently all gonna own nothing and be happy about that. This, this um, phrase that comes out of the World Economic Forum, mm. like how, how do we get there? How do we get in a place where it's, completely clear that at the minute uh, a virus is being used to reshape the face of the world and mm -hmm. for these global governance institutions to take power as we're talking uh, right now there's this uh, world health organization treaty where the world health organization is going to write take the right to uh, take control of the country's health services to various degrees um in, when when it declares a pandemic is going on um so it, does this all directly emanate from the mind of Cecil Rhodes in the 1890s? Does it all come from the Rothschild family in the uh, 1790s? Or is it not that? Is it there's an ideological kind of continuity that's going along and that, that that's a more kind of mm. subtle and sophisticated way to understand it? So I don't, I don't really claim to know. I, I'm, when I get to that deeper level, I'm, I'm grasping a bit and I might not know by the end, but I want to have a, a clearer picture um, to, to settle some of these things in my own mind and then yeah, I don't know, then um, not do anything about it, probably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, well, at least well, I can go I, to my grave thinking, I knew, I, knew, I knew exactly the game they were playing. There we go. Uh, that's right. At least you put the effort in. But, <laughs> I, I mean, uh, we, we are basically trying to educate the audience in a proper manner, in a responsible manner as well. Because there is a fine line between information and disinformation what is true and what is not. It just seems in this day and age, in my opinion anyway, 
that the level of information is less and less. I mean, this is how I saw 9-11. 9-11 was basically a fight for, on two fronts, a war for information from the federal government and a war of disinformation from the common people who are being brainwashed or manipulated by uh, fringe conspiracy theorists unintentionally or intentionally, right? In terms of history, we, and we spoke about this years ago, about the hidden history of the, of the United States. And um, the less and less we know about our, our existence here on this earth and in this world, uh, the less we can know, but we can believe that we know, but we can't act on it. And that leads to the quote. By well, that's Ebon. exactly it. Okay, so just to retract what I said about not doing anything about it, my, my hope is that I'm of the opinion that Alex Jones and, and the David Icke's of this world have done a lot of good. Whatever bad they've done, they've done a, a heck of a lot of bad too. They've done good in that they've broken people out of their conceptual bubbles and say, look, there's this big nefarious conspiracy going on. And they're basically right, but they might be wrong in a lot of ways. And my thing is, okay, but we have to move on from that, right? We have to develop a more grounded and accurate way of seeing the world that says, yeah, there is this, this great conspiracy going on, but this is kind of how it's working, not necessarily in a, a cartoonish manner. And I think that the more clearly we can embody that of ourselves, the better we are communicating it for whatever effect that has, we can't know. Right. But we're more able to like see something like the, the COVID response and say, yeah, okay, this is clearly like not to do with um, preventing the spread of a virus and clearly to do with this emerging imperial agenda, whether anyone's conscious of that agenda or not, whether it's just how people tend to react or, or increase their size of the pie. Um, that, that's really the goal of it. And to root that, to root that criticism of the state, that conspiracy theorizing in absolutely rock solid history of like, well, look, no theory is necessary. The United States spread out and took over all these different countries and it just carried on from there. And we're still living in that history. We're not living in uh, that rapper Zuby has a great line. It's like where people he's criticizing people about how they just trust governments now on pandemic responses. Mm -hmm. like, have, you, have you read history? Right? Do you think that's over? And we live in some sort of a fairy tale mm -hmm. now, right? And like, just look, look how it works, right? And he's like, yeah, that's my best. We're still playing. We don't live in a post historical fairy tale. We live in history. What's going on in the Ukraine now is history. You can understand it from understanding mm -hmm. the Crimean War and Afghanistan in the eighties and the proxy war, the Russia-Japanese war, um, not like, oh, we're all perfectly nice now and uh, we just want to have humanitarian interventions for those evil Ruskies keep ruining it for everyone. Mm. You know, that, that's what I'm trying to do with the series. Richard Cox, co-host of The Dark and Dower, producer of the Energy of Empire series, and you can find him at Deep State Consciousness. Richard, thank you very much for coming on, Bill. Thank you, Adam.